Yes, we're going to continue with the Gita because we started with the Gita last week. And I'm just going to give a brief praise because there are so many new people here. The Bhagavad Gita is uh, one of the most famous books and um, been studied by the greatest philosophers of our time in all traditions. It is also taught in the top universities of the world because of its, um, well, its deep spiritual values and properties. I mean, there's everything you need to learn about your spiritual and worldly path. How you combine the two is found in the Bhagavad Gita. Because the Gita starts with a war. Arjuna, the warrior, has a war to fight with his stepbrothers. There are a hundred in the team that is unrighteous, and five, which is Arjuna and his brothers, in the team that is righteous. And, you know, I won't go into the history because I did it last week. And if you want to go to the history, please look at last week's talk. You'll get the whole background. And the whole Gita summarizes, um, sometimes in our life, we go into war, many times in our life. And the war is really, the allegory is, the war is really with ourselves. We are battling with a hundred negative thoughts and the five good ones that, you know, we're constantly battling with ourselves. And many times, the battle in our mind, because it's in our mind, we get experiences on this earth that reflect the battles in our minds so that we can over them, transcend them, accept them, or go through the fight. In Arjuna's case, he didn't want to fight because the people he had to fight with, guess what, were his family. His grandfather was on the opposing battlefield. His teacher. So he goes, how can I battle with my teacher? And how can I battle with my family? Even though they've done wrong. Even though, and they had done wrong, and they've given them chances for 14 years to undo the wrong, but they still didn't. So, with Krishna on his side, Krishna is the uh, representative of the divine energy, or the universe, or God, whatever you want to call it, the reincarnation on earth. So, Krishna represents that high spiritual self in all of us. And um, both brothers, the stepbrother that was supposed to be evil and Arjuna, both approached Krishna for help. Both. And this to me was very enlightening because, you know, when uh, in our own lives we see good and evil all the time. We see good and evil all the time. And we try not to judge, but the truth is there is unrighteousness in the world and there is righteousness. And both sides, you know, you see people who are not so good and they still go and pray and ask God for help. Don't they? Mm -hmm. You know, if you read the Ramayana as well, they still pray, they still go to temples, they still do all the things that you would think would make them good. But then they don't have the good values. Because they use that energy that we call the universe of God. You see, this is why I love the Gita as well, because it makes it very clear that the energy does not, does not punish. It's like a powerhouse. If you use it to hurt, the results you will get will be painful. If you use it to bless, the ultimate result, although the beginning results may seem treacherous and difficult and hard to do, in the end, will always win. If you look throughout history, just look through all the battles that you've read in history, good always overcomes evil. And it almost seems at many points in history as well that it's not going to happen. You get to the point where everybody's like, like World War II with Hitler. So many people died and you think, oh my God, he's going to overtake the world. But no, it doesn't happen. The good always wins. And this is, you know, it's like all the fairy tales that we watch, right? There's some truth in that. But they always have to go through so much trauma. Have you noticed? So much adventure, so much self-discovery before they get to the truth. So, 
they both go to, so the both parts go and see Krishna and for help, which is good and bad people both ask for help. But Arjuna asked Krishna for his part by being on his side. And Durodhana asks Krishna for his stores of armies. So one asks for help in material things. And the other one asks for help by saying, Krishna, if you come with me, then what else do I need? I don't need the armies. I don't need all the material things. If you are by my side, I can do anything. So Krishna goes to the battlefield with Arjuna and his brother Durodhana is across the field. They go into battle. At the last minute, Krishna goes to Durodhana and says to him, Durodhana, Please, we can stop this battle now. Why are you doing this unjust thing to your stepbrothers? Why are you doing this? It is not too late to change. And you can change the tide of everything if you just give them what they deserve. And Durodhana says, no. And then Krishna says, too late now. Now you've had it. So the battle begins. So Arjuna is in this chariot and he's with Krishna, and he goes in the battlefield, and he sees all his family there, and he goes, he starts shaking, he gets very frightened, and he says, I really don't want to fight, my lips are parched, my, my legs are shaking, I, you know, this is no good, why am I fighting? I should go up to the mountains, meditate, what good is it? We're all gonna die, what, I don't believe in battle, I don't want my brothers to die, I don't want to do this. And he starts making all kinds of excuses why he won't go to battle. And Krishna says, he smiles at him and he says, wake up, look who you are. Look who you were born to be. You're a warrior. That's who you're born to be. This is your job that you were karmically born into this world to be a warrior. It is your duty to protect your nation. If you do not protect that which is right, what is going to happen? If you are meant to be a monk, then you would have been born a Brahmin. Then you can go up to the mountains and meditate and not fight the battle. But you weren't born that way. You were born as a warrior. And you have. You have a duty to fulfill. Uh, because if you don't do that which is right, what will happen to the world? And then Arjuna goes, no, 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 I can't. And he keeps so much fun when you can share things. You know, I know so many people who are so talented. Oh no, I can't share it because what if they get better than me? You're going to die with your knowledge. And you've done nothing with it, but keep it to yourself. What for? The more you share, the more it becomes abundant. The more you receive, the more, you know, the more you give, the more you get. And I know this to be true because every time I, when I first started teaching, like I said, I'm very much a student. And every time I went to a course and came back, to share it with everybody. Oh, I learned this, this, take out your books, buy this, buy this, buy that. And the more I taught, the more I received from the universe. It just, the knowledge just would come to me, even without trying. Because there is no fear, it's abundant. We're all on the same journey. Let's have fun. Let's walk together, talk together, share together. But in those, there's also a boundary of awareness, not to take advantage, not to hurt, to respect. This is all part of it. To respect space, to respect time, to respect people's energies. So in that walking together and being together, there is also that awareness, that consciousness that must develop along with it. So you see, we have many things to learn, so much in one lifetime. So much that it's really very exciting to be alive in this time. Because we're, this knowledge has never been given more freely in any other era of this birth as we know it. Everywhere you go on the internet, you have the knowledge. But don't just send the emails out with the good messages, live. 
have the courage to do that. And this is what Krishna is telling Arjuna to do. Walk your talk. You're a warrior. Here it's come. Walk your talk. And that's what once we all do that, we become examples of light. And I think uh, my time is up. Yes. My request. Would you read this one? The one oh. I told you. Okay. That's the end, because I thought it would suit this occasion. Would I you so like to like explain to, to people? Or shall we get the writer? To I think we should get the yeah. writer. Yeah. I can't so see. It. <laughs> That's I think you need a mic. Your voice is you still up here. I think it will suit this occasion. I read it so many times, so I just thought it was so well written. Let's, would you I'm come sure that's all that you have read it, but <coughs> they will shut the key. Sit there? Yeah, you can sit on the hot seat. <laughs> Look, he's got no fear. He's got no fear at all. <laughs> no, he should be. Well, that's our Gibraltar newsletter. And uh, when we went on a Sevilla retreat a few years back, Les wrote this article. And Turtu uh, got the newsletter from us last week. And she loved the article, so... She asked if we could read it, and that's where it's coming from. Les wrote it. Yeah, well, that's just what I was going to say, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's called I'm Not This Body. Um, I really don't know where it came from, because it, the retreat was such an inspiration, that particular one. We did a lot of silent reflection, didn't we? That was a, did. It was a silent retreat. And this one just came to me, it just like flowed out during one of those silent sessions. So anyway, I'll read it, and I'm grateful to Turtu to, and to, uh, appreciate her... Um, <clears throat> she would make me blush now. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, I'm not this body. As I pass into another body, I flow like a golden breeze, swift and silent, a glow in the beam of the never-dimming light of light. I cannot be seen by the human eye, nor heard by any terrestrial ear. So I pass into the physical form and acquire the senses I must possess to experience the world around me. This is not the first time I've flowed into human form, for I've done so on many occasions before, and shall do so again many times in the future. But is it the future that is my journey? Is it the past that has been my journey to this point where I am flowing once more? Does time keep the logical sequence in the ethereal that we assume it does in human terms, when we are in the guise of a living, breathing being which is limited to five senses? In celestial form, I can tread the path of time back and forth. It does not matter which way I walk, for my journey is not merely to move along the passages of time. My journey has a higher and a deeper purpose. As I flow from one body to another, my passage should take me upwards, not along. I say should, because once I attain a human body, in my physical form I am bound to forget why I have attained it. If I knew, then the journey would lose its purpose. In forgetting, I am presented with a choice, to continue upwards, to stay at the same level, or to fall. In descending, there is no limit, I can fall for an eternity. I can also choose to remain at the same level for all time. Only in rising is there a limit, but it is set very high. The peak is realization, a goal of eternal peace and joy. How high it is above me depends upon my starting point. How low did I fall? And so I enter this new physical body. I know it because in my ethereal state I selected it. But I cannot tell its future path. I blend with it, for I am spirit, and I dissolve into its human form its terrestrial characteristics. I must begin this fresh state of being as a baby. Life and its experiences flood into my head, and I must relearn the words that echoed so clearly in my spiritual mind. You are of this world, sorry, you are on this world, but you are not of this world. I sit still inside. I rest quietly inside this body, while the physical senses struggle and strain to take in this new world. The physical begins to think as it experiences. It learns, absorbs, and seems to become full. But I, 
sit still, quietly within, waiting for the thoughts to turn their attention to me, and when they do, I awaken. And the journey takes on once more its original meaning and is renewed. We must work, for once the thoughts inside this human mind turn to me, action replaces inaction. Inaction retains the status quo and the journey stagnates, it goes nowhere. We go nowhere. But action begins and choices are made. The energy created produces momentum and this time, again, I choose to move upwards. I am the soul, I must continuously move and in moving create continuity. And when I shed this body and return to the freedom of the celestial, I may wait before I flow into another human form. I may choose to remain free for a while and enjoy whatever I bring from this current physical state, or I may opt to return to the shackles of the human form. However, the choice is not always mine, for it depends upon how I live on Earth. Next time, I may choose a different planet. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm struggling with this.